Hello, hello. Today is the very last day of College Chemistry Tube Notes. This is the very last uh, portion. After this, there's nothing else except for tests and quizzes and then, I guess, college and the rest of your life. So that that's pretty fun. So we left off the other day saying, hey, in this video, we ended with this. Take your the time to watch um, or to try to spot all 10 of the different functional if you did that uh, right now, I'm going to post some, I guess, answers. So starting at the bottom left, here is a amino group and a carbonyl, uh, carbon double bonded to oxygen. And together, they make an amide. So this is an amide group. Above it, here's a carbonyl and an oxygen. And this, again, there, there's like four that have a carbonyl um, Actually, five. Well, there's, we can look right here. One, two, three, four, five. So you have to pay close attention to what is next to it. So if it's a nitrogen, it's an amide. Here, it's an oxygen. And there's actually another one right over here that has the same carbonyl next to oxygen. But the difference is this one continues on to more of, of the hydrocarbon. And so this one is an ester. Yes, I don't want to do that. I don't like writing with this. Um, let's see. So over here, if it's a carbonyl with a hydroxyl group, which is an OH, it is a carboxylic acid. Again, what's important to note is this one is acidic. This hydrogen can come off when you have these two together. At the very end, here's another carbonyl. If it has a hydrogen on the end, then this makes it an aldehyde. Beside it, here's an oxygen that just happens to have nothing but carbon on both sides. And if that's the case, it's called an ether. Uh, over here is just a plain old sulfur all by itself. With, we call that a thiol. And here is a nitrogen by itself. You notice this nitrogen is directly connected to that carbonyl. This one, there's space. So these two are not considered, since there's a separate separate carbon carbon bond these are different but this is an amino group and then here we have a carbonyl with just other carbons on both sides making it a ketone and finally actually there's this one more after that here is the hydroxyl group and <clears throat> um, it, it, we would call that an alcohol and then if we want to talk about this entire ring this is an aromatic ring um, and we would refer to it as a phenyl group or benzyl group, depending on how, how we were naming it. And then here's how you would name this thing. Uh, I would not ask you to name this thing because look how long and ugly that is. Uh, we could talk about are there any points, any chiral centers. Um, and for that, remember, we would look for carbons that have <clears throat> more than four things attached or, or at least four different distinct things attached. And if we were to do that, I don't know, I haven't actually thought about it, but oh, there's there's one. So again, there's a unshown hydrogen when there's three things. Oh, there's another one. So these are two chiral centers. There's probably another one. Or maybe not. Yeah, those might be the two chiral centers. Um, and that's what, actually this, we, we haven't talked about how to name different optical isomers. We're not going to, but the 2Z refers to um, that those specific types. Um, now, again, going to naming stuff, again, we have this huge, ugly name that we're not going to bother. Yeah, we're, we're going to name shorter stuff. Um, but I do want to point out that, again, for larger molecules, we can follow similar naming strategies. So here's NyQuil. It's got three active ingredients. Um, and depending on, the, again, the same rules here, we have amide when there's, there's an amide. We see phenyl for the aromatic. And hydroxy is, is the alcohol group in this case. Um, but it's better known as acetamethan. 
And here we have chlorophenylamine, but the actual name is this down here, which looks pretty ugly. Um, here we have dextromethifer, da 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 something. And then, ugh, look at all that. And again, all these 4BS, 8AR, 9S, that is telling you about, since this one has a three-dimensional, like, kind of uh, ring, um, it's telling you more stereochemistry. But yeah, there's a lot going on there that we're not even going to try to name. Now, I want you to know those, those 10 functional groups, but there are other larger structures, notable structures that, um, you know, frequently pop up. And this, uh, and so I just wanted to point out a few of them. And so the first we have is a steroid. Now, I know you've heard of steroids. You know that, oh, you shouldn't take them because while it might make your muscles grow faster and larger, they're, they're, they're bad for you and most commonly illegal. But not all steroids are illegal, and you consume some of them every day. Um, so steroids, in a chemical sense, has this type of uh, ring structure, these alternating rings. Um, and so some <coughs> common examples, testosterone and cholesterol. So again, if you enjoy a nice cheeseburger, you're going to get plenty of cholesterol. And so steroids are actually a type of... Um, they fall in, uh, they, they can fall under lipids or different hormones. Uh, but again, being a steroid just tells you that it has this same type of ring structure. Uh, but then there's, there's a number of things that have that steroid group, uh, a purine. So it has these amines, some here, secondary tertiary amines, but there's a, so it's a heterocyclic two ring system but we have things like adenine which you find in your dna and then here's caffeine um and, and one of the reasons uh you know caffeine keeps you awake is um, adenine and other things like it they bind to what are called adenosine receptors that have kind of a sedative effect and caffeine is having a very similar structure because it has the, the purine structure is an adenosine receptor binder and so it binds to it and it prevents other adenosine molecules from binding to it and making you feel sluggish Pyr pyrimidines very similar um, but get rid of half of it um, cytosine so again we have two different dna base pairs and barbiturates which are usually a class of illegal drugs but are also <clears throat> also found in you know in some pharmacy uh components indole rings uh tryptophan one of the amino acids and indigo so very common pigment for things like genes and other things that are blue and so i'm, I'm i've just gave two examples for each of these but you could look up hundreds of different compounds many that are familiar to you that have these ones and there, there's definitely other ones oh ribose so this is just a, a five carbon or six carbon sugar um, dna atp nadh which is down here found which you get as in part of the electron transport chain um, during the citric acid cycle um, but yeah there are plenty of other very common groups and that's why i'm gonna go back 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 here um just no this one doesn't have any of them oh wait no like this one has the pyridine and so sometimes you'll see so instead of an air, benzene ring it's got a nitrogen and so the name just says pyridine and there's other examples of that um but yeah we're not gonna worry too much so you don't have to know these ones i just you know there's other large group a little bit larger than the functional groups that they're they will have a specific name and that name will influence um, their overall name okay so this is where i would hope that you would feel comfortable and at least in practicing and with everything being open note answering these questions so draw these compounds and name these compounds and so oh and then watch this video 10 plants that could kill you and I, th I think i remember what they all have in common is they're all organic chemicals remember organics all natural so it should be good for you but that's that's not true so you should watch that video um so
practice drawing these, you could do either the, the shorthand, the skeletal notation, or you could write out every carbon at your call. Again, but again, we, if we see own, it's going to be a ketone. If we see al, it's going to be an aldehyde. If we see thiol, it's going to have sulfur. En means there's going to be double bonds. Bute means there's going to, there's going to be four, <coughs> four carbon atoms in a chain. Phenyl is going to be the aromatic ring. Amino is going to be the nitrogen. Um, penta is going to be five carbons. Hex is going to be six. Dimethyl is just going to be, uh, there's going to be two methyl groups. Um, so yeah, that's really ugly looking, but you should practice that. And then over here, try naming. So where this would normally be one, two, three, four, five, you would normally call this pentane uh, because there is a alcohol, a hydroxyl group at position three, it's going to be called three pentanol instead of pentane. Um, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so seven is hepta. And if we start counting here, one, two, three, four, it is going to be four ethyl because this is an ethyl group. But instead of heptane, it's hep, um, hep it's going to be heptanoic acid indicating that there's a carboxylic acid. And you could put one or one heptanoic acid, but normally if it's at position one, you would assume you can you can leave it off the one off and it's assumed to be at the end because it has to be at the end. Okay, so besides the functional groups, the last part of this chapter is on a couple different reaction types that might happen. Um, and, and so they generally will fall into two categories heterolytic and homolytic. Again, that word hetero or prefix hetero means different. And what's different is the electron distribution. And so if we're specifically talking about for heterolytic things that are polar, again, we've talked about how polarity affects properties and mixing, um, but they also affect chemical reactions. So here we're saying we have a polar bond where B is more electronegative than A, and in, and in a heterolytic uh, reaction, we're going to get a bond breakage where the electrons end up on one, one element or one atom, and the other one is left without. And so we'll end up with a positive charge and a negative charge. Um, so the, the bonding electrons just go to a single atom. So the other category is homolytical. Uh, again, homo meaning same. Lytic, the, the, as in lice, uh, means to break. Um, now, the, this this is for what are called radical reactions, and they're they're not nearly as common in biological reactions. But this one forms free radicals, and um, this is when the bonding electrons just split, and it's an equal distribution. They both take their electrons back and you end up with free radicals. So we're, we're going to look at kind of both of these and how they play out. So if it's a heterolytic, again, which we're, we normally have these partial charges because things are polar, and different functional groups will change that polarity. Again, adding, again, we talked about adding a hydroxyl group. You know, methanol is very different from methane. So not only does adding an alcohol group raise the boiling point substantially, but it will make it polar. And so this leads to one of the atom being electron rich, one being electron poor. And we then, in organic chemistry, we refer to them as nucleophilic or electrophilic. And so a nucleophile is nucleus loving. So it's going to be the partial negative atom that is electron rich, but it yearns for the, the, the nucleus of something else. The electrophile, electron loving, is going to be the partial positive. So it's wanting to be, it's attracted to something that's electron rich. And so here we're looking at one, two, three. So this is one bromo pent or one bromo uh, propane. 
And then here's a hydroxyl group. So carbon having electron density drawn away by this bromine, this carbon has a partial positive, 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 and the hydroxyl is negative. So this carbon is the electrophile. So being partial positive, it attracts electrons, and this negative is attracted to partial positives. And so here we're seeing, we would call this a heterolytic reaction. Bromine is getting displaced, so we get bromide all by itself. And now instead of bromopropane, we have um, propanol, one propanol. And there's, there's tons of rules to reactions, and so we're not, we couldn't possibly cover them all, but we're just looking at some examples. Um, now when it comes to heterolytic reactions, the more polar it is, the more prone it is to react. So again, not all polar things are equally polar. So here we have um, two chemicals that are very similar. This is one, two, this is diethyl ether. And here we have um, ethyl uh, methyl acetate or ethanoate. So it's an ester where it has one carbon on one side and, and one carbon on the other. Or So this is either ethanoate or this is the acetate group. And so it's more commonly called an, um, an acetate. But the difference is this extra ketone. And so... If we were to look at the bond polarity, the one on the right, having this oxygen is pulling electron density away and it makes it more polar. So this oxygen is more polarized than the other. So if we look at how, what would it take to break this bond, this same carbon oxygen bond in both of them, um, what we'll find is that the ester is more easily broken. The bond enthalpy will be lower. So as the electron distribution was already more polarized, it's easier to break esters than the ether, which is less polar. So esters are generally more reactive than these ethers. They, they'll generally have um, higher boiling points because they can hydrogen bond, but they're more chemically reactive where ethers will have lower boiling points because they can't, they don't hydrogen bond. Um, so they'll, they'll have lower boiling points and be more volatile. And so there, there's three, a um, couple examples I want you to see, um, see here. And so the most common, the, the most common names that we'll use for heterolytic is condensation and hydrolysis. And these, these are, typically reserved for when we're talking about reactions in, in aqueous solutions, and it's combining or breaking apart. So if you have an alcohol, it has a hydroxyl group. If you have a carboxylic acid, it has a carboxyl group. And what can happen is those two can combine. So they combine to produce an ester and they release water. Now, you could say if water is this just byproduct that's lost, notice the R chains are now to get together. So these two have combined um, <clears throat> at, at the expense of losing a water. And so this is called a condensation reaction. So it's like they've condensed together. But yeah, alcohols and carboxylic acids, they react to make an esters. Again, if, if we were actually meeting, I have a lab that we were going to do where we combine um, the these two and we produce an ester that smells minty, um, the, the wintergreen chemical uh, that you find that flavors gum and other stuff. It's really, really easy to make. Uh, now, if we take an ester and heat it up, we can then hydrolyze it. So hydrolysis, hydro meaning water, lysis means to break, is literally in just reverse. So water comes in, breaks this bond and you get an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. So again, if you look at what would happen if you add an OH on, on, on the carbonyl side, you get a carboxylic acid. And over here, we just get the alcohol back. Now, if you have two alcohols, they can combine, they can condense to form an ether. So two alcohols make an ether and then in reverse, Again, if we have the hydrolysis of an ether, you get two alcohols. 
And then if we're talking proteins, every protein has an amino group and a carboxyl group. And when they combine, you get the carbonyl of the carboxyl group attached to the nitrogen and you get an amide group. So I mentioned before that peptide bonds or pro the bonds and proteins that hold amino together, they are amide groups. And so if you break proteins down, again, that is called the hydrolysis because in every case, it's adding water across the bond. Uh, so OH goes on one side, hydrogen goes on the other to restore the different groups. Oh, and here's a video you should watch. Yeah, go, go and watch that. <clears throat> Again, so looking at biomolecules, oh, and I just talked about this, but here's an example of three amino acids, alanine, serine, and cysteine. Again, if, if you compare, here is the, this is the base unit of, oh, I, I, I missed out on part of it. The base unit of every single amino acid is exactly the same. There's a central carbon, there's an amino group, and there's the carboxylic acid. So notice that they're the same on all of them. Then the only thing that's different is the R group. So cysteine has a thiol. Serine has an alcohol. Alanine just has a methyl group. And so that's that's the same or that uh, for every amino acid. Well, proteins are a polymer of amino acids. So if we take each you know, the carboxylic of one, the amino of the other, uh, then we get this. We have a tripeptide, so, and we get amide bonds. So here's an amide bond, there's an amide bond, and there's all this stuff sticking off of it. Um, if we talk about sugars, again, in besides, so glucose and fructose are monosaccharide single units but if we're talking about something like sucrose normal table sugar it is a disaccharide and so sugars have all of these alcohol groups hydroxyl groups all over them and they will combine to form ether linkages so here's sucrose and there's an oxygen right between again if, and if we look at larger <coughs> larger complex carbohydrates like starch or glycogen, they're all linked by ethers. Uh, let's talk fats. Everyone loves fats. It's the most dense, it, dense energy storage uh, biomolecule. So they're known as triglycerides. So they have three fatty acids, which fatty acids have long carbon, 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 carbon chains and a carboxylic acid group. And then they combine with glycerol. So glycerol is a three, a three carbon, three car uh, hydroxyl group. And this is supposed to be a times that doesn't like my multiplication symbol, but there's three spots. So alcohol, carboxylic acid, alcohol, carboxylic acid, alcohol, carboxylic acid. And so fat, fat molecules, these triglycerides, they have ester linkages. So again, here's the three carb, <clears throat> three carbons of glycerol, and then linked to three different fatty acids. But they have ester linkages. So when your body needs more energy and it starts breaking down fats, it hydrolyzes these esters. Same thing when your body needs to, when your body's using the energy from sugar, it hydrolyzes the ether bonds. Or if you're in starvation periods, your body will start breaking down proteins and it will hydrolyze the amide bonds. So we have uh, different functional groups that combine to link other, um, other larger molecules. So this is where I'd want you to practice this. So I'd say, hey, draw these two things together. And what you would see here is there's a ketone and then there's a carboxylic acid. Here's an aromatic ring, and here's an amino group. And the one we talked about is that the amino group and the carboxylic acid, they can form a amide link. So here's what you would get. And then he, he, what would be the hydrolysis? So here's an aromatic ring, here's an ester, and when hydrolyzed, it will break between and so again when you say hydro it's it's adding water so condensation releases water hydrolysis adds water 
So it's going to add a hydrogen to this side, and it's going to add a hydroxyl to that side, and that's not very pretty, so that's why I'm just going to hit this, and there you go. I'm going to get rid of my stuff. Um, <clears throat> Oh, so, oh, okay, this isn't finished. So here I just broke it apart, but to finish it, again, the this, you get an alcohol here and a carboxylic acid there. So again, notice we're adding H2O. Again, so you can link them together, but then large, large chains are called polymers. And so proteins, DNA, uh, carbohydrates like cellulose are all natural polymers. Uh, rubber is a polymer of isoprene. Uh, here is DNA and protein, so a polymer of nucleic acids and a polymer of amino acids. Um, but then the, we're going to end in looking at some synthetic polymers. So they, they also follow the, again, if we're talking about plastics, it's all organic chemistry. Polyethylene, polypropylene, vinyl chloride, nylon, Teflon, there's a bunch of them. Um, these are all they have many units, uh, poly meaning many, mer is the unit, and that gets repeated over and over and over. Uh, now, the synthetic polymers, as opposed to following heterolytic rules, where you have polar things, these are going to have homolytic, what are called addition reactions. And so when you hear the word ad addition, it's literally you're going to be adding things on top of one another and so here, here's here's a simplified version of this so here's r2 now this is commonly in the industry chlorine gas that if you shine light on it it causes a homolytic um, breakage and you get two chlorine free radicals and what's notable about free radicals is they're very reactive because they they don't want to stay in this radical form so they're going to go and want they're going to go and try to steal an electron from something else so let's say you introduce the small hydrocarbon ethylene so ethylene has a single carbon bond or double bond between its two carbons and that extra double bond which we said last semester was a pi bond it is a perfect candidate for the attack of this free radical so this free electron is going to come in and steal one of those shared pi electrons. And what happens is that radical then forms a new covalent bond on this carbon. Now, the other carbon got to keep its electron because the radical only took one. However, that electron is now a free radical. And it, it has that same yearn for another electron. So Imagine this is in a huge vat of ethylene. So there's more ethylene present. So that free electron is then going to take another electron from another pi electron, and you get a longer chain. And so you might see where, where we're going here. So we have a longer chain with another free radical, and this can continue on and on for hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of molecules, until eventually you either get, you run out of material and the chains can't get any longer, or you get two radicals that connect like shown here. So these two, these two terminal ends uh, combine to form this spot right here and the, the free radicals cancel out and you have these really, really long molecules. So again, these, these monomers can be hundreds to hundreds of thousands of uh, atoms long. And so this is what we call a polymer. And again, when we talk about here's polyethylene, what would be showing here, this is polyethylene plastic. So, you know, lunch baggies and all different sorts of different um, applications of plastics. Now, if you want to change the property of plastics, you just change the monomer. So instead of F ethylene, here's propylene. So there's an extra carbon. So now, uh, instead of all hydrogen sticking off, you have alternating carbons. And so this is how you get polypropylene. So most bottles are going to be, or a, lo a lot of different packaging, stronger plastic is polypropylene. Uh, you might see, it might say PP on it. Um, 
or instead of a methyl group, maybe you add a chlorine. And so now here's chloroethylene. And if you have these alternating chlorines, this is how you get polyvinyl chloride or PVC piping. Or put an aromatic ring. So here it's called a, a styrene. And if you polymerize it, you get polystyrene. And if you make a foam out of it, this is how you get styrofoam. Or maybe attach all fluorines. And then instead of hydrogens and ethylene, you get all fluorines. And this is how you get Teflon or polytetrafluoroethylene. And this stuff is pretty neat because it has pretty much almost zero van der Waal London dispersion forces. And so it's perfect for non-stick material, things, coating things that make them not stick at all. And there's a video about that right here. But what I want you to see is if you change the monomer, you can change the properties. And there's there's other things you can vary, like you can vary the length of the, the chain. So different types of bottles use um, either called, it's either called HD or LD for high density or low density, where the longer the chain, the higher the density. And so here, here's a something that shows that. Uh, you'll also find um, numbers on plastics that tell you how what you what they're made out of and whether you can recycle them or not. So look at number two and four, high density polyethylene, and number four, low density polyethylene. So they're both polyethylene, but depending on how long the strands are, will give them different properties. Um, let's see what else. Here's nylon, which is a, has an amide linkage. You've heard of polyester. Um, I think it's this one up here. Yeah, this one up here. So it's got ester linkages, polyurethane, which is used to coat furniture and boots and things like that. But yeah, there's a lot of different types of plastics. And they, they generally all follow, or most of them follow the addition, the homolytic reaction. And then here's, you should, here's a video you should watch about biodegradable plastics. Now, if one monomer can't give you the properties you want. Remember, if we, we talked about alloys. So if one metal doesn't give you the pr properties you want, you could make an alloy where you mix metals. In the same way, you can mix different monomers to get copolymers. So if you need this type of night, what we call a nitrile glove, we have acrylonitrile and butadiene, which were copolymerized. Uh, rubber tires, which is the same type of plastic used in chewing gum has styrene and butadiene and then all of these combined you get abs so abs is the type of plastic used in legos so it has acrylonitrile butadiene styrene uh, and so all three together give them the properties that are just amazing for you know legos uh, another just fun fact, uh, Kevlar is a copolymer. So Kevlar, if you've heard of, you've probably heard of Kevlar, used in bulletproof vests. Um, so most people know it for body armor, but it, it has a number of other uses that are shown here. And it's a copolymer of, what's, what's this one? One phenyldiamine. So it's an aromatic ring with two amino groups and tetraphenyl chloride. This one has... Essentially, um, it's like a carboxylic acid, except it has some chlor a chlorine on it. But you end up with amide li linkages, which is why in the name it has the amide. Uh, super glue. Uh, super glue is another great example of a fast-acting polymer where uh, it's acrylonitrile or these cyanoacrylates. Um, and for them to polymerize, it's catalyzed by water. And so the reason it doesn't polymerize inside is there's no water um, inside. But as soon as you add it, if it's if there's any humidity in the air, it will catalyze the reaction and polymerize really, 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 really fast. OK, now <clears throat> I have a couple slides that are technically unfinished that the last time I taught this this section, I started to look at some techniques used in organic chemistry, but it's not completely finished. So 
I don't know, I'm going to I want to just mention a couple of them. So if you're working in a, a drug lab or a chemical company or just any place that has to detect what do you actually have, because like 99 percent of all organic substances look like white powders or clear liquids, you can't just look at them and know what you're talking about. So there's a number of different techniques that are used to chemically identify. And so, so one of them is called infrared spectroscopy. Remember, spectroscopy looks at how light and matter interact. And so what we find is that there's all these different bending and stretching motions in the, in the bonds, that the, they're, they're, the atoms are not perfectly locked. So if we say that the bond angle is 105 degrees, that is an average an average angle. Well, these stretching vibrations are on the infrared spectrum. And because of that, they absorb infrared frequencies, which is helpful. Um, and so what we find, though, is different functional groups will absorb different distinct wavelengths. And so this is vanillin. It's the substance that gives van vanilla its smell and aroma. And this is its IR spectra. And you can see on the x-axis the wave number in inverse centimeters. And so this is these are frequencies. So it's it's technically measuring the wa inverse wavelength, but um, yeah, wavelength of the light that's absorbed. And so here's a peak around 3,500, which is going to be typical of a hydroxyl group. Here's a peak around what is that? 1950, which is indicative of an aldehyde. Now here's a peak at, what is that, 1600, which tells us there's going to be carbon-carbon double bonds. And so collectively, you look at what peaks you find, and it tells you what functional groups are present. And so here's a table. Here's a table, by no means do you have to study this, that tells you, oh, if you have uh, an alkyne, a triple bond, then you would expect an absorbance here. But if you have a nitro compound here, um, and so this is a really simple and easy and very common technique for identifying these unknown organic substances. Uh, another one is called NMR. It stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. Um, and what this one does is looks <clears throat> looks at the nuclear spin of the atoms. So every nucleus has this, this type of spin and it's typically random, but when you, what you do is you put the chemical in a very strong magnetic field and it causes the atoms to align either with the magnetic field or away from the magnetic field. Um, and then what you do is you pulse it. So you send a very, very weak pulse of, a, of electromagnetic energy um, and what can happen is it can make these atoms flip so essentially just like invert and from that information it can tell you a lot about the local chemistry uh, and the functional group so again the same thing vanillin by seeing this entire region here tells you there's an aromatic group so if you see these specific set of peaks then you could pretty much say, oh, yep, there's a benzene ring in there somewhere. Or this peak up at 190 is indicates there's an aldehyde or an alcohol group here or an ether right there. And so we have these different techniques that, uh, again, most of these fall under spectroscopy. They're all, they can be used in collaboration to identify an unknown substance. Um, and again, here is another table that shows common, these are called chemical shifts value. So to zero is, so zero is, is the, the standard. Uh, and then there's typically that, and then you look at how far things have been shifted from zero. Uh, and so again, you can see uh, nitrile groups, alcohol groups, esters, ketones. And so these can work together to help you figure out the structure. Oh, and that was carbon NMR, but then there's also hydrogen NMR. So this one works pretty much the same way, except it helps it. It looks specifically at the frequency for hydrogen. And so different atoms and I should say different isotopes will have different frequencies. Um, 
But again, you don't have to really know anything here besides uh, you can look at these absorbances or what they call chemical shifts and it will tell you what types of functional groups. And then here's another fun table. And then if you ever take organic chemistry, you'll look at this stuff down here where some of the peaks get split up into instead of singlets, doublets, triplets, quartets. Um, like one thing you might note, well, it's really if you were to zoom in on some of these, you might find this splitting. And what the splitting does is it can tell you whether it's like a primary carbon or secondary or tertiary. So how many other things are attached to it? So there's a whole lot of information involved. We couldn't possibly get into it unless we wanted to go for another month, but we're not going to. Uh, and I did want to mention that um, if you've ever had an MRI, that it's the same type of technology. They put you in a big magnetic field, they pulse you with radio frequencies, and it, it allows them to get images of, say, like a herniated disc, which is not super great. Um, I these, and this is what one I didn't finish because I I don't know it wasn't mass spectrometry. Um, it we talked about this one last semester. Um, essentially, you you send a particle flying and use a strong magnetic field to push it, and based on how far it gets deflected, you can tell its mass. Now, there's a little bit more to it though because during its flight, it also fragments, it breaks apart. And depending on, so here might be the mass of your chemical vanillin, but you get all these other fragments of, of it breaking apart, uh, chemically breaking apart. And that can tell, be, if this just tells you the mass, you can look for the masses of these different fragments that can then tell you what other functional groups are present. Okay, and with that, um, that is the rest of chemistry. So uh, I'm going to leave you there with 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 these this important announcement. Um, so anyway, we have quizzes coming up. We have tests coming up. We have finals coming up. Oh man! And I wish we were together so we could you know celebrate the end of this. But that that's okay. You know, I'm sure you're doing. There's plenty of other fun things you're getting to do um, not being here. But definitely email me if you have questions. Google Classroom now has its own Google Hangout feature, which I've yet to actually use. But let me know if you need to talk about things and we will um, we will we will talk about those things. Anyway, I hope you have uh, enjoyed the class and let me know if you need any help and hopefully I get to see you at some sort of graduation because you know you, you definitely earned it. Okay signing off.